Sure. Okay. Lars. Well, I'm going to stick around. I'm going to stick around. I'm just not going to turn the video on. You, you know, it's still like five. It's four, o- four o'clock in the morning for you. I yeah. know. <laughs> so. Hey, Lars. Hello. Nice to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. What a lot of numbers you can cram on one screen. I came in just at the tail end of the previous speaker. Yes, yes. It's uh, the first part of our webinar. It's all about, you know, the team talking about the financial markets, news, etc. And at the bottom of the hour, we we have an interview almost every day, uh, let's say four out of five days. Um, so in this case, you are the guest of honor. <laughs> so uh, w- what Dale, our host, usually does is he asks people to tell a few things about you uh, themselves. So I guess that's where we can start with you. And, and by the way, before you do that, I just want to say nice to meet you, Lars. And thank you for joining our community today. That's my partner, Blake, Blake by the way, Lars. But yeah, no, the screen told me that was Blake. Blake, Blake. <laughs> So me, I was born in Denmark, spent a long time in America, as you can probably tell from my accent. Now I live in Greece, so I know how I was um, <laughs> And uh, I, I, I'm, I guess I'm an angel investor, which uh, is my sound no good. Can you hear me? Uh, it, it, yeah. If, if you, uh, there is a little bit of an echo. If you, if you can plug in an actual microphone or a headset, would cool. definitely help a lot with the quality of sound, uh, Lars. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, mate. Absolutely. Yeah, Lars, the weather looks beautiful there. I like the trees uh, blowing through. Oh, yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I highly recommend uh, moving to Athens if you're in too hot weather and voting uh, <laughs> on the arguments and so on. Lars it's, lives uh, in a very, very nice area next to the school our kids uh, go. That's how I met Lars, actually. His uh, lovely daughter is a schoolmate of my son's. Um, let's give him a second to connect his headphones. Yeah, you guys keep talking. Yes, absolutely. So he lives in a wonderful area, and I have to say, Dale, that we've uh, we've had unusually cold weather uh, during the past few weeks for Greece, but now uh, since a couple of days ago, we've gone into full blown um, spring. Yeah, oh, so man. it's it's finally here with us. Yeah, looks like Southern California, kind of. <laughs> Just like that. Can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Let's see, I'm not quite sure. Yeah, just choose uh, at the bottom left where it, where, it, where it says mute. It has a little arrow. It has all the audio settings, so you can switch uh, your audio yes. to your current headset. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now you're in my headset. Oh, that's yes. much better. Yeah. Perfect, oh, perfect. Good. That's very good. Yeah. Exactly. So Lars, don't why don't you I tell us a few things? Uh, why don't you tell us a few things about your first career and yes. what you've been doing now? <laughs> yeah, so so look, I, I'm a computer scientist by training. I a PhD from UC Berkeley a long time ago. And uh, then I joined the startup scene in Silicon Valley back in the dot-com bubble days. Gosh, this is my third bubble bursting. I mean, not bursting. I mean, I don't know what's about to happen but uh but yeah during the startup uh that died in the in the dot-com crash and then uh i started my own with my brother that did mapping technology and we we sold our little outfit to google before we launched actually we were just four engineers and a prototype and some patents and that turned into google maps which was super proud of and still that's by far my most successful Oh, I am. Thanks, Blake. <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an Apple user, and I refuse to use Apple Maps. I only put good, Google Maps good, on my good. iPhone. So, <laughs> well, thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and so that then I worked at Google for a while, um, and uh, and then I switched to Facebook, which is a very common Silicon Valley career path. It's like a conveyor belt outside of Google that takes you over to Facebook, and I uh, worked there for four or five years. And then I, uh, I tried my hands on um, entrepreneurship again. I started a music tech company with, uh, with my wife, who's Greek, which is why I, I ended up moving to, Greek, uh, to Greece. And um, that started still around. It hasn't quite taken off yet. We actually just handed it over to a, a younger team to lead it so that um, we can focus on angel investing. And so I joked that, you know, if you can't do, you invest. 
And that's uh, that's kind of what we switched to. I, we, we started angel investing so very slowly a decade ago. And those first investments, the ones that didn't die are now starting to show great promise. And in fact, probably my, my second proudest professional achievement is that I helped start a company in Australia called Canva um, that um, was these two kids from a mining town in Australia that wanted to build better online design software. And I got introduced to them by a bunch of kite surfing crazy techies that I know that likes Australia because it's good kite surfing. And I helped them build a tech team, the first tech team. Like the, the two founders were not uh, software engineers. And so I helped find out, I put some money in their seed round of a lot. And that company is worth $40 billion in their last. It's, it's amazing. Lars, my wife has been using Canva for her small business. Uh, she's She does a... If, uh, she's a retailer, online retailer here in Scottsdale, Arizona. She's been using Canva right. for like five years. And it's crazy that it's developed by two young kids out of Australia. Two young kids out of Australia. Say hi, yes. couple. That is wild. Wow. Hi. They were, yeah, yeah. They were like in their early twenties when we met a couple married now. And um, it was just a crazy story. I mean, they, 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 they had something, you know, it's this weird thing. You can't put your finger on it, but they had, they had something and they, they, they had built a little company bootstrapped in their basement that did design software very specifically for yearbooks for schools. And they built that on their own. It was, you know, small business, small niche. Um, but they really, really kind of got their appetite up. And then they ran into some Silicon Valley folks that came by Perth, the mining town in Western Australia, because there was excellent kite surfing there. And then they started learning about the Silicon Valley approach to startups and they got hooked on that. And, um, and, and we ended up helping them, you know, with their pitch, with how to, how to structure a Silicon Valley thing. And my particular job uh, was to help them build a tech team. So I'd actually, it's a long story, but Google Maps was kind of created in Australia. Um, I love Australia. Uh, it's my second favorite place in the world after Greece. And, uh, and we did most of the work there. And I, it's, it, I started Google's engineering office in Australia which um, you know, was the first person to, to join as an engineer. And it became, I think there's like a thousand engineers working there now. And so I had access to the best engineers in Sydney. And so I could help Mel and Cliff hire some of those people because we met just as I was exiting Google. And, um, uh, and it just became this phenomenal success. Um, blows my mind, actually. And, you know, I often look at, so now I've done maybe 60 or so, uh, angel investment, mostly like first money in. And um, a lot of those have, all, have died and some uh, are starting to take off now. And I try to like look at what I knew when I invested and, and only what I knew when I invested, right? And trying to see patterns of, of, uh, of, of um, who is successful. And, uh, and, and I swear, you know, those, those Two would not have been my pick if I just like lined them all up and imagine I had the same information at the same time about everyone. And, uh, and it was quite um, an amazing thing. But looking back, the things that they had that really stood out was this incredible tenacity um, because, you know, they didn't know much about this space. And it took like two years from when I first, when they first started engaging with these Silicon Valley folks, I got maybe a year later involved. It took maybe two years before they actually had a company and they started um, writing code. And, um, uh, and in those two years, you know, many times uh, any normal person would have long since given up and they just like would not give up. And, uh, and a lot of the, these, these interactions were done on a beach in, in some exotic location like Hawaii where everyone's kite surfing and partying and, and these two guys who happened to be very good looking and young and, and, and so on, they were always in the room working. We were on the beach party, they were in the room working always, always, always. <laughs> and they would just not give up. And, um, and then the other thing is um, the, the space they were in had this unique property back then. It was very different from most of the, the, the kind of subject matters in tech, which is like online design or design, digital design was completely dominated by Adobe. There was like this one incumbent that had bought or out competed everything in the space. And, and so most people stayed away from that area because it's like game over. Like Adobe just like runs the show. You can't, 
beat that. And Mel and Cliff were like, yeah, but their products suck. And, um, and they knew that because Mel had kind of made her pocket money when she was going through school in Perth by teaching people how to use Adobe tools for exactly the use case, uh, Blake, you're talking about um, you're working with small business owners needing some graphical design for the business. Right. And they would come to her and spend six months learning how to use Adobe's tools. And then they would spend like $2,000 on buying the software or they would find it free on the yes. web, right? It was crap, just to make right? a flyer. Yeah. yeah. I mean, for, for that use case, I should, yes. I should say, yes. right. That these are, these are tools that are really made for the professional designer, but it turns out a large amount of the revenue back then came from people that, profoundly didn't need that kind of power, right? They needed something much easier to learn. And Mel is like, there's got to be a better way. And then they, they kind of tested her theories with this yearbook niche thing, right? Where a teacher would go on their product and they would just design a yearbook through various templates and choosing colors and putting all the pictures of the students in and the funny one-liners, right? And then they would actually like produce the books and send it back to the school. And through that, they really learned what kind of user interface should you give to someone who cares about design but they're not a professional designer and then that's what they took out to a much broader market uh, with Canva like you can design anything it's uh, I, I think Canva. every YouTuber on YouTube uses Canva I think it's incredible and it, it's, it's, you it's, know it's, they're just good what a success story like I said it's crazy and I like to think it's kind of like the 50 company 60 or so I think now I've invested in it also have it kind of funny it's it's the, it's one of my smallest investments ever in in, in dollar terms. I wish of course, of case. course, it's never the big one, right? <laughs> right. Of course, we say that in but training it is, too. <laughs> it is the one. It is the one that I put the most like sweat into, and uh, and I'm I'm super proud of when when Mel tells her story. You know, she she like what, their company is one of the like top five in market cap terms private software companies out there. Wow. And so she gets a fair bit of, of press time. And I often get a kind mention that I played an important role. You know, there were two of them. There are actually three co-founders. And I introduced them to that the third one, who's with someone I've worked with at Google, uh, who's kind of both a software engineer and a user interface designer, Cam Adams. He's incredible. And uh, that he landing him took like almost a year. Uh, from wow. when I first introduced him to the young, because he had he had left Google and started his own startup. And it's very hard to like recruit someone who's just founded their own startup into someone else's startup. Although I think he could tell from the minute I introduced him that this was not like a better thing for him to be involved and, in. He would, I, I, I was I was gonna there. ask, you know, the the do you you play, I mean, a lot of those roles in in Silicon Valley, um, and obviously you were there and you lived it. Um a lot of it is relationships, right? It's like who knows who and who can match people up with the best person. Right. Uh, and and and, and I want to, I got to ask you: Did have you watched? There's a show that's out right now. I believe it's on. Uh, I believe it's on Show Showtime. I forget which whatever my wife has me subscribing to these days. Uh, it's called Super Pumped about Uber. Super pumped. Oh my no, gosh! I haven't seen it. Oh, you, you've got to see it. It's uh, the the actor that does it is phenomenal. Anyway, I think it's a. It would be interesting <laughs> to hear your take about this this uh, you know depiction of 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 what happens in Silicon Valley with with, with Uber specific case. How you took uh, engineers away from Google and you know and, right. and it's it's right. interesting. It's such an interesting story. But I guess the question I wanted to ask you is how how important is it to know the right people in Silicon Valley? And is it a big city? Uh, I mean, a big little town, if you will, or is it a small, big city? I forget how you would say that. No, I mean, it's, everyone knows everyone there, right? And, yeah. and uh, like when, when, we, when we did our maps thing, we weren't connected to anyone. And, um, and uh, we'd been part of this kind of failed academically rooted startup, super, super technology crazy actually you all use it every day you don't know about this because we ended up selling to qualcomm that does most of the chips in our phones and this the the data that gets sent is actually encoded with the technology that this startup had had um, uh, like owned there was a professor at uc berkeley who started but we did we were academic we have a lot of business sense 
But we, you know, I met, we met one guy, my brother and I both worked there. We both got laid off when the bubble burst and this company ran out of money. And it was one guy that we'd met like once or twice. He was on the board of the failed startup. And um, once we got our prototype and mapping up and running, we, we gate crashed some panel event, sort of like this, but live, right? That he was in. And we're like, hey, you don't remember us, but we were these guys at that startup that failed that you're in. And from that one guy, we got all of the connections, 10 different VCs um, uh, that all turned us down and one VC that almost invested. Um, you know, you go through this funnel and we got, I, I kept asking them, how far are we in your funnel? And we got to the 70% mark. So like we got to a place where they invested in seven out of 10 startups I got there but we became one of the three <laughs> they didn't invest in. But by the time we were done with that process, they had introduced us to a number of people that they thought would help us out if they invested. One of those guys, Ram Shiram, happened to be on the board of Google. Um, and he's like, look, the same reason Sequoia, oops, I mentioned their names. I love Sequoia, actually. Um, <laughs> That's and, a big and they were completely. There. It, yeah. it was very exciting that they almost invested, <laughs> um, but they introduced us, you know, and they were very square about it. They you know, they didn't in any way, shape, or form renege on a on a on a promise, right? They were very clear. Look, you're you at the seventy percent mark. They even explained which startups end up being in the thirty percent that don't get invested in, and it's 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 either that one uh, a bigger company turns out to be doing something in their in their space, which was what killed out, killed our deal that Yahoo was doing stuff and mapping. Or they find something wrong where you know something has been misrepresented by the entrepreneurs. That was not our issue. Anyway, so we we found that in a 30% category and the they didn't get the investment, we're bummed. Um, and we had, by the way, we, we had told everyone sort of through our lawyer that Sequoia wanted to invest in us. And you get this this thing called the blessing of Sequoia where everyone else wants to co-invest. Uh, and Sequoia was cool with us playing those cards and they warned us, but there's also a curse. You know, if you fall on the other side of that 70-30 divide, it's very hard to explain yeah. why we didn't invest. And, and that played out. Everyone knew. Yeah, everybody, had, everybody's like, well, had, why did you fall into that yeah, bucket? Right, right, right. And then it was all over. No one would touch us. But Ram, he was like, look, the same reason Sequoia ultimately decided not to invest, which was in Yahoo was rummaging in the in the mapping space that same reason is going to make google want to buy you because google has nothing in this space google really loves the idea of leapfrogging everyone you have this much better thing that just kind of needs the resources to become much much better than the map quest and yahoo maps and microsoft maps that was dominating back then and so he introduced us to larry page and so you know like from this one guy we knew from this failed startup board that's CEO for change later, we're meeting with uh, with Larry Page, and he's like, "I like what you guys are doing." And then uh, then they bought us, uh, which was fantastic. And then we our prototype instead of becoming an independent product, we 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 spent like nine months turning it into Google Maps, which is a phenomenal ride. Um, that is, that is awesome. I mean, I, I I can tell you, at like I said, as an Apple user of I don't know a decade or whatever, I refuse to use Apple Maps. I hate it. <laughs> I, I loathe it, and I just go directly to Google Maps, and, and it's That's the good. first thing I do. That's the first thing I load on any phone that I've ever gotten for the last decade. The but, fun um, part, Blake, I, is that Lars also uses Apple products. <laughs> yeah, and I, I well, saw I saw as I watched, so. Yeah, I figured, I figured uh, you know, he probably falls in the same camp as a lot of us uh, people that have adopted iOS, uh, you know, the, 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 um, the, 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 not technology, the, um, the I want to say the biosphere, but that's not even it. But, you know, we've adopted all the, you know, Apple technology, but we, I, I still refuse to use their maps. I always and Lars, your brother worked also uh, for a moon in, uh, in Apple. Am I correct on that? Yeah, yeah right. so we, we, we left Google at the same time and um, not by design went to, <laughs> to Google's two biggest competitors. <laughs> you know, I went to Facebook and Jens went to Apple. And, um, and actually, Jens specifically was like, hey, I know a little bit about maps. You guys seem to be uh, struggling. I'm sure he put it very diplomatically. And so they brought him on board to try and, and, and help them. And what, a couple of things I want to say about Apple Maps is one, one thing is that it was one of the, like, the highlights of the Google Maps success that 
um, that the original iPhone, before anyone could write third-party apps, came with a Google Maps app built in. And that just like, and it was even a blow of mind. And actually, interestingly, we, my brother and I didn't even know this was happening. Wow. That you know, Apple's secrecy that Steve Jobs was still around, and his secrecy was so intense that we couldn't even know about it. And uh, Eric Smith, who was the CEO of um, of Google back then and sat on Apple's board, he one day he was like, "So, hey, you should check out Steve Jobs when he's on stage. You're gonna like it." <laughs> <laughs> so that's how we found out that Eric was like, "You should love me. You should look at his presentation." And there's our baby on this magic phone, and uh, and it was funny because we'd always like talked about you know for 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 maps really to take off, you need it in your pocket. And, uh, but no one had made a phone that made that viable. Actually, before the iPhone, Google Maps, we had a ton of different apps, a ton of different phones. And we were by far the most downloaded mobile app of its day. And nobody used it. Like when we look at our usage graph and compared web browsers to mobile phones, you couldn't even see mobile phones until the iPhone came out. And, and like within months, suddenly you could see that graph and we could plot out when they were gonna cross over. And of course, now it's it's you know it's the web it's the web graph that you can. You, you know what's interesting, Lars? I, I got to tell you this. Just for, it, it, it ties into the way I know Steve and and Greece. Uh, so uh, when I met Steve in person, which Steve, how long ago was that? Eight years ago? Seven years ago, something Seven, like that. Yes. Years. Yeah, and and the the thing about uh, cell phone technology at that point in time, especially when you travel outside the United States, it just it wasn't as proficient. Like I had to go. I had to call to get, you know, international, it, it wasn't, you know, just easy. Right. And so I used to just connect to the internet via, you know, wherever, um, you know, I was getting coffee or when I was in Athens and I'm, my son was being baptized where my wife and I got married in Milos. Uh, so oh, I, I, yeah. And so, so I swung by to, pick, uh, to meet Steve on my way out of the country, my sister and I, but you know, what's funny is I actually, always ran Google Maps on my phone because no matter where I was at, I could see myself on Google Maps, even if I didn't have internet connection at that point. Right. That was like eight or nine years ago. Isn't that wild? Oh, right. That is wild, yeah. What kind of phone was this? Is this an iPhone, an early iPhone? I can't remember. But it was like, I just downloaded, I just started using Google Maps at that point. So, yeah, I don't, but I remember looking at Google Maps and saying, I'm walking around Athens with no cell connection, you know, right. but I, but I could see myself on the map. So I knew kind of where I was at. So it was, right, right, right. It was awesome. so um, Blake, I, I think Lars is the perfect person to have here uh, for him to answer a few questions. He be, he's been in the in and outs of um, the tech startups and angel investing, as he said, so um, it's a discussion we've had when we were on vacations and prior to this. Uh, I think it's a good idea to get his take on where he thinks we are currently in the cycle. Uh, he already mentioned uh, that he had been there in the 99-2000 uh, tech bubble burst. Uh, he was there definitely in the 2008-2009 uh, financial crisis. Lars, from your side of the river, how does it currently feel? What do you, what do the people you work with, etc., think about what's happening at the moment? Has liquidity obviously started drying up? Uh, how, how does it feel to you? Yeah, no, it feels like uh, it feels like there's a really high chance of a similar kind of rapid downturn in terms of the availability of venture capital for tech startups. And um, it hasn't quite happened yet, but everyone that I work with are preparing for this mm -hmm. um, and, and kind of freaking out. And um, which is, well, on the one hand, it, it's too bad, it's, it's a distraction and so on. But on the other hand, I always like to think that the, my biggest success with Google Maps actually, it started at the bottom of a downturn. And, yes. and I think actually uh, you'll see that that's, that's not a total coincidence, that there is definitely 
a case to be made that when 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 things are tough, people are more willing to do their own thing. And in fact, it's it's not only that, if, if I may, uh, Lars. You know, Austrian economics uh, believe and have coined the term malinvestments. So right. the the uh, idea about it is that when you have a bubble. What is happening is that there are a lot of malinvestments happening. Malinvestment is, in essence, when capital, right, land, and labor are getting directed in their own projects, right, for their own reasons. So after malinvestments are being destroyed at a big extent through the natural economic process of having a recession, then you have the economy pushing those resources in what is actually worth it, right? right? So from an economic standpoint, that is how I would interpret what you just said about Google Maps. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And, and then the way it felt from the inside, right, that the startup that failed had been malinvested. Cool term I just learned, right? So, so money was too easy. We raised too much money in the sense that we ended up building up way too much burn rate relative to the market fit we hadn't quite found yet. And when that money dried up like this, it was super painful to get rid of that uh, burn rate. And, um, uh, and conversely, when we, were, when we were there, my brother and I and two Australian mates that joined us, there were several times when, um, when uh, you know, we probably should have given up. We, most people would have given up. And on one hand, I'd love to say that we had that same kind of tenacity I saw in Mellon Cliff on that beach in Hawaii. But, but a lot of the truth is that no one was hiring. Like, no one was hiring. Well, Google was hiring. And we did have a, a semi-serious discussion. Should we just give up this thing and just go get a job at Google? Um, and we decided not to. But I, I, it's quite possible that if it had been boom times, we would have um, gone and gotten a job somewhere anyway so what does it feel like now it feels like we're about to see the same thing that 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 companies have raised a lot of money and build up a burn rate that's unsustainable without access to really easy venture capital are about to face some pretty pretty rough i have another question for you i want to see uh from your perspective in what percentage do you think that this environment of too easy money negative real rates has cultivated, um, in essence, an environment that a lot of startups, instead of being the product of some people that have a dream, uh, are now more of an opportunistic attempt to, you know, suck some of that liquidity up without really caring about, you know, the end goal, success. You know, I don't know. Have you actually I, seen this? I mean, in front of you happening, or no. you still think that the people that are doing this are still idealists? No, no, I don't. I have never encountered someone who would who, do, who did that. What what I what I think happens is that it's um, well, a couple of things. It's intoxicating when someone offers you lots of money with with little effort and at high valuations and so on. But there are also examples of of you know competing companies where the winner is the one that raises enough money, in particular in kind of the more capital intensive spaces like hard- hardware like like i think if you compare gopro to some other companies that were building cool cameras at the same time you know gopro is like all the, the all the deep stuff inside does not come from gopro right they, they came from chip manufacturers that would sell to anyone. There are a lot of companies trying to do this, and and I heard actually an analysis from one of the one of the companies that lost that he was like we didn't raise enough money, and and the other guys did. You know, we were being conservative. We were afraid. We were being conservative. And the other guys didn't. They just outspend us, right? And it worked that they they were able to like, GoPro was able to get to a point of being a self sustainable. So in essence, so we got not... to a point that being conservative with at the good old times was the prudent thing to do was a negative. Actually, it, it reduced your chances of, yeah. you know, competing, it's, right? Yeah, so, yeah, so you, you, can, you can fail in both, <laughs> both ways, of course. 
um, you can fail. And, uh, and you know, we've, we've seen we've seen it a bunch, right? With, uh, you know, SoftBank is kind of famous for coming in and saying, look, here's a space and we're going to, where there's a bunch of neck on neck competitors and we're just going to pour extraordinary amounts of money into one of them and just tell them to outspend the other guys, right? And sometimes that works and sometimes it becomes some pretty spectacular failures. That um, there isn't there also you know, like you were mentioning a uh, thing about Uber. I think there's there's a series out there about uh, WeWork too, isn't there? Oh yeah, I, 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 I have not seen that one. I uh, just the uh, the Uber story is just so interesting to me, you know. Yeah. And Travis, look, I, Yonek, yeah, yeah. I, so. I, do, I don't know uh, I don't know much about Uber. I had a few friends who worked there who seem to indicate that the, the kind of cultural issues that got talked about a lot were somewhat very, very toxic from what it seems like. Yeah. And I remember reading and, a lot about it in the news over the years, you know. Right. So and it's interesting, well, like my impression of like, like the, 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 the culture inside startups can actually be dramatically different. And I think like the culture inside Canva is the diametrical opposite of the culture that I sense from the outside in a, in a company like Uber. It's very different. Oh, hey, Lars, sure. uh, this is uh, Dale Pinker. Nice to meet you. Enjoying hearing your story. It's inspiring. Can you tell me how a guy, I forgot his name, the guy from WeWorks uh, ended up in a position like that and attracted all that capital? Um, and he thought he was the Messiah. Kind of looked like him. <laughs> Look, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know the inside. Uh, I don't know the inside of this. Uh, only okay. what I've read. I, uh, you, know, you know, and I, but I think it was this, the SoftBank approach to investment is that you know they they have so much they have so much cash to invest, like a hundred billion dollars, and just like an extraordinary amount of money, and they, they kind of have to deploy them. And they they build up this theory that they would look in these they would identify an area where there were a bunch of sort of neck on neck offerings where, where they believed that simply adding money would give one company the competitive edge. And then I think they were like, go to all of them and say, Hey, here's this extraordinary amount of money that you would never even dream that you could raise right now. I'm going to just like throw it at you um, so that you can outspend your competitors. And I think that's basically what, what happened. And he was the other, the, the we were guy was someone who, um, Neumann. The money. Adam Adam Neumann. Neumann. Yeah, yes. Yeah. That's yeah. That's, okay. that's it it is it is crazy and and what timing to just uh ahead of the pandemic I mean <laughs> um Lars I, I got a yeah. question for you since you since you you you're invested in so many different companies and I and I think a lot of people that are entrepreneurs um you know my wife would be included in this bucket you could throw her in this bucket as well she's she's had a startup um that is actually you know she's in her seventh year and it's just starting to hit the her stride uh the the more of the um uh you know uh, how should i say the the escape velocity point in her business but when you yep. deal with startups um you know whether technology or not technology when when do you see Companies that do survive, um, where do they hit their stride usually? Where they're they're like you know the the the, the product or the the service is now proven and and starting to make money and it's really starting to take off. Is there is there generally a time span within that first ten years that are are, are, are is a sweet spot for growth? Well, so the ones I have in my portfolio, which is you know sixty sounds like a lot, but it's a very small sample size compared to how many. Uh, tech startups are made out there sure but but i have i have uh, i've honestly seen almost all of them the first time they launch it, it you can tell immediately that they have captured the imagination of a, of a large group of customers large relative to the group they're they're attacking right and and the ones that don't in in my portfolio they don't make it Generally speaking, there's still somewhere the jury's kind of still out, including my own startup, by the way. Um, uh, the, the one I just handed over to a younger team, they're trying to pivot now and finding another route. Yeah. But like when you look, if I rank my portfolio uh, in, according to, you know, paper value relative to how much I invested kind of thing, they all have this property that their first launch really wowed people. And not like there were you know, millions and bajillions of users overnight, but 
Uh, actually, one of them built satellites, so that's a very different, different kind of use case. Like that that is, yeah, satellite. and I was say that's a that's a long term <laughs> technology that you got to really. Uh, that's oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's it's funny. I uh, you know I try sometimes to kind of write down these are like a thesis of it, of investment. This is what I like to invest in, and whenever I try, even in my head, I invariably the next investment violates whatever I just. I just written and so you know I, I don't know how I can barely use a screwdriver. I'm a software engineer, and then this guy came and and a young guy in his 30s and he's like going to build better satellites, and um, and he somehow convinced me that he was going to build better satellites and they're like a, a billion and a half now in value, possibly wow. also you know easy easy access to capital and so on, but they raised you know they haven't launched their first commercial satellite yet they launched one prototype satellite that kind of proved that their stuff works um and they raised like 200 million dollars before launching their first actual commercial satellite which is doing just a few months um so exciting but they're getting a lot of excitement from customers you know this is a very very different thing from a consumer software product like canva but uh, you know i think they've sold uh, quite a lot of these already before launching one uh, Lars, we have a very interesting question from Anthony, uh, one of our viewers. Um, I'm just forwarding this. Any take on the argument that the anti-competitive takeovers of smaller firms uh, and this way increasing com- uh, concentration by leading companies stifles innovation? I mean, you're the perfect person to answer that question. Yeah, well, I mean, look, I think for a thriving ecosystem, you need the big players that are exits for smaller players. And um, I wish there wouldn't be so much, um, well, I guess what people would call anti-competitive behavior. But I think on balance, having those big players um, is good for the ecosystem. And, and you, can, you can see that, that, that small companies are able to find places where they can overcome these bigger companies. But Canva versus Adobe is a great example. Um, but, you know, if you look at Facebook, my former beloved employer, um, uh, Snap came out of nowhere, started as a startup, managed to carve their ten billion, tens of billions of dollars worth of niche, right? And, and TikTok, um, even more so, right? Like a $100 billion company, I think. It's hard to tell because they're owned by this much bigger company, but... But it, it is possible. And TikTok started, uh, you know, as, as a separate thing and grew big and got bought by this Chinese company. Um, and so it's still, it's still possible, um, except certain things are hard. Like I would not start a mapping startup today, for example. Um, <laughs> Completely <laughs> different think, environment, of course. I think yeah, it's a little harder now. Um, and actually, it's funny, Blake, you were talking about Google Maps right now. Uh, sorry, Apple Maps. And uh-huh. one thing I want to say a hundred times over that the Apple Maps that they launched was like a thousand times better than Google Maps when it launched. Oh. It's just that Google Maps had raised the bar so much by then that it didn't yeah. it didn't fly. And then they kind of tried stuffing down people's throat by by uh, kicking Google Maps out. And I, I, I still get so frustrated when when uh, whatever app I'm using forwards me over to, uh, you know, and accidentally, I accidentally clicked over to Apple Maps. I'm like, damn it, I didn't want to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same feeling. And actually, there's this conversation. I wasn't unfortunate there, but the guy, uh, when we launched Google Maps, after Google bought our little four-person company, Google added two people to the team. One was a product manager, Fred Taylor, one of the smartest people I've ever known. And... Uh, and he became, uh, he, he's actually like the co-CEO now of uh, Salesforce, I think. And he was a CTO of Facebook for a while. He was actually the one that persuaded me to go to Facebook. But he, wow. he at some point, uh, had a conversation with Steve Jobs about uh, Maps. Because it got tense between Google and, and Apple because of Android. And then Apple wanted their own maps because they won't depend on, on Google. And I, on, I imagine Google tried to say, no, 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 come on, let's be friends. Uh, and at some point, uh, Brett and, and Steve had this fight about maps. And Steve was like, we're going to just do a better user interface for Apple Maps. And, uh, uh, and, and Brett was like, but if you don't have the data and if you don't have the, uh, you know, the search know-how, 
people are going to not care about the better user interface. And, and Steve apparently was adamant that the better user interface would win over the not so good data. And, <laughs> and I think he was just like the, the, one of the rare, 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 rare cases. <laughs> so he was, not, he was not quite right about that. I mean, yeah. Google Ma Apple Maps is a is beautifully well done app. By the way, the Google Maps that preceded Apple Maps was an app built by Apple using Google Maps as their back as their the data source. Oh, yeah, wow. so like so like we drew the maps and we did all the resolutions of queries and all this stuff, but the actual user interface was uh, was Apple's. Not, not Apple's. I, I still I I I don't think Apple has a their their user interfaces. Well, actually, let me take that back. The I think it looks nice. It just the it is definitely not as intuitive as Google Maps, in my opinion. But anyway, so. I'm not going to argue with you. <laughs> <laughs> Lars, I'm, I'm pretty sure because we, we have to start an, another webinar. I'm pretty sure that we, we should do that pretty, you know, soon again, because we still have a, a lot of questions for you. People really uh, enjoyed your presence with us. And by the way, uh, guys and girls, um, I have to tell you that Lars has a lot of stories you want to hear about having to do with tech politics as well. I remember that story you told me, for example, about Taiwan on the weekends. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, almost and, started World War Three back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this is one story you want to hear, absolutely, because it's going to give you a good insight of how much intertwined, you know, big tech and politics are uh, nowadays. And we also can further the conversation about um, what you think is the profile, but I don't want to do it now because I don't want it to be rushed. So you'll give us another date that you are available. And uh, if it's okay with you, we'll have you again. The other thing I would want us to talk about would be, what do you think is the profile of the companies that are going to fail and or succeed following the next bubble burst? So bottom line, if you had, if you now had a lot of dry powder, if you were invested nowhere and you had a lot of dry powder, where would you be aiming for under the current conditions and circumstances. So I think that's something that the people want to hear. Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's, you can already, I guess my answer from what I said earlier, right? That it's, it's the companies that have an appropriate burn rate relative to their market fit achieved so far. Right, and companies that have built up uh, you know, like a massive staff and a massive burn rate just because the money was there and in a hot space, but they haven't actually found a market fit yet. Those are the ones I think are going to... Yeah. So basically, Lars, going back to the traditional economic model, because a lot of people are unaware, and we'll close with this, but in the past, companies that actually found investors before we go to the era of easy money were companies that the vast majority of them were companies that could already prove that they had a business model that worked. So and actually, then they got money to scale it up at a big well, extent, right? So, okay, so yes, but I think it doesn't have to be business model as in you're starting to make growing revenues and so on. It, that's a, an awesome thing to have, but you can also just by proving a strong market fit in the consumer space, you will still be able to uh, even after the uh, crash, right? That if you have a lot of engagement and user growth and so on, um, I think that'll still work. Like a, a lot of like consumer products grew very, like, you know, Google and Facebook are good examples, right? They, they grew super, super big without having revenue. And then once they had that user base, they started making revenue. And, uh, and I, I'm pretty sure like a Facebook, given its growth rates before it started making Money could have would have easily raised money even in the the, the kind of downturn that we're about to enter. Dale, let's yeah, let's sure. find let's find the date for uh, Lars uh, for next month if that's okay with you, Lars. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, perfect. Okay. So Lars, I, I'll, Lars I'll really you really appreciate you spending your time with us today. It's uh, really pleasure. nice nice to meet you and and really Likewise. quite a pleasure. Likewise, everyone take care. Yeah, you do, thank, you, thank you, Lars. Much. Thank right. you, Lars. Uh, thank you so much, gotcha. Lars. Yeah, maybe we'll meet someday. I, I dream of going to Greece. 
you you all should come to Greece and we'll go we'll go on a boat ride together and talk tech. You have to ask right. me <laughs> to ask me about the Taiwan story once we, if we have a little drink and also the brothel story. Steve, I haven't told you the brothel story. No, you haven't. So that's something to look uh, forward. Yeah, yeah, well, yeah. figures there'd be sex involved in tech, right? Anyway. Right. By the way, I don't know what you're doing tomorrow. We're going to the Attica Zoo with the kids. If you want to join us, we'd love to. All right, speak I'll, with, speak with Alomida. Yes. <laughs> yes. All right. All right. Bye bye, Mitch. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye. So, uh, everyone, uh, the team's uh, doing the morning edge two minutes ago. And I want to thank you guys, everyone here, for your attention. Just a reminder sign up so you can watch the event next weekend live at Trader Summit. Uh, keep, uh, you know, still considering uh, Trader funding. And uh, thank you for being here. We left it all on the court for you this week. Hope we added value. Uh, that's our goal every week. And uh, we're here to build up and edify traders every day. So have a great weekend. Thank you team for everything. And most of all, don't just count your pips, count your blessings. Have a great weekend and happy anniversary team. Yeah, for happy our... anniversary. Thanks, Dale. Really appreciate okay. you. Adio adios, everyone. Have a great weekend. Bye bye, Dave. See ya. Good job today, Steve. Really nice. <laughs> Thank you. Very good. Very good. All right. It was a pleasure. <laughs> All right. See ya. Bye. Adios, everyone. Hey, traders. This is Blake Morrow with Forex Analytics. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like these videos, share them, and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss any of the content that we provide here for free. Thanks for stopping by. I'll see you in the next video.